You are listening to the Foreign Policy Focus Podcast. We cannot wait for the final proof. The smoking gun it could come in the form of a mushroom cloud. Haven't you driven enough people from their homes over bulldoze their villages, seize their property and their laws? They had no part in making Now working in Libya with friends and allies, we've demonstrated what collective action can achieve in the 21st century. Now the host of the show, Kyle Inslee. This is episode 425 of the Foreign Policy Focus podcast. On today's show, I'm making the case that at 70, it's time to dissolve NATO and talking about quite a few of the news stories going on right now, issues between different members, the U.S. wanting to, other nations to pick up more of the tab, Marcon saying the organization is brain dead, and some of the issues that uh, Turkey is creating now. So all that will be discussed on today's show. Uh, if you want to share the show, you find it online at the Libertarian Institute. I write the Daily News Roundup at that site as well. Both of those, uh, the show and the Daily News Roundup, are featured on the homepage there. If you're a new listener to the show, make sure you subscribe to the show somewhere. It's on the Libertarian Institute All Podcast feed, and it's on its own podcast feed under the title of the show, Foreign Policy Focus. Last, if you want to be a donor, patreon.com slash foreign policy focus. So there's a few things I want to get to on today's show before I talk about NATO. Uh, the first is this case in Texas where uh, this man, Mr. Guy uh, is his last name, is having the, the state seat the death penalty against him after he shot a man who was crawling through his window. Now, it turned out that this intruder was a SWAT team member and they were in the middle of, of a no-knock raid. So they didn't announce themselves. They're just coming into the house. Apparently, they had a search warrant for narcotics. And they were actually showing up at the right address, unlike in most cases. Uh, all they found in his house was a glass pipe and a grinder. Uh, the way it was described, it seems to me that, the, you know, these are probably marijuana accessories and not, you know, heroin, meth or anything like that. Not that, not that it should really matter, but when people hear narcotics, I think they get very concerned, you know, that they're talking about one of these really ugly drugs. In reality, you know, it sounds like this guy was maybe, uh, you know, had a little bit of pot. Well, they didn't actually have any pot, but, at the very least, at one point in time in his life, smoked a little bit of pot, so he had the accessories around. So now the, the state of Texas is trying to invoke the death penalty against him. And I, I know I focus the show on foreign policy, but I do like bringing up death penalty cases but because it's another place where the U.S. government asserts its right to kill people at its own whims. Uh, same for the good, you know, the, the greater good. Now, a lot of cases uh, of, you know, where the death penalty involves, there's issues outside of, you know, this case where it's the religion of the police. You know, I believe that the man, uh, Mr. Guy, is a black man, so I'm sure that isn't going to help his case in Texas, unfortunately. So there's, you know, the race element there. And, you know, most data on the death penalty shows that minorities are far more likely to get it than, uh, you know, white people even for committing similar crimes. But, you know, in a lot of cases, there's questions around the evidence. Is, is this person actually guilty? Now, in this one, it seems more or less straightforward that, you know, Mr. Guy had issued the, the police officer. It was just a matter of, you know, if as an American citizen, you have the right to shoot an armed man crawling through your window, um, especially when that person does not announce himself as being a member of law enforcement. Uh, you know, it, it very much seems like this guy did, didn't have anything to hide at all. I mean... I, I'm not sure there's anybody who would make the calculation that, you know, you're afraid of the cops finding your, uh, you know, bowl and grinder, so you shoot him in the face. I mean, at most, this is, you know, a ticket. You might not even have to go to court. You just pay the fine online or something like that. Um, you know, so th this definitely wasn't the case of, you know, the a crazed out crack at it, shooting at a cop crawling through his window, and, you know, he was sitting on a bed full of meth and, uh, you know, this was somebody that had to be tra taken out the streets for the good of the community. That, that definitely isn't the case here. So it's absurd that they're seeking the death penalty against him. Uh, but there's uh, some good work done, and I'll link to an article in the show notes page by Jordan Smith writing at The Intercept on how all the kinds of evidence that are typically used in, in all criminal cases, but, you know, when you look at the death penalty, like DNA, and in this case she's writing on fingerprints, are a lot more dubious and complex than people think. Uh, fingerprint analysis, hey, we, you know, know Sherlock Holmes, uh, kind of you line them up, the rigids and the arts and all that kind of business, and it's very easy to make a conclusion. Uh, but in the real world, you know, especially at a crime scene where you know, things are probably pretty messy, um, 
very hard to tell especially you end up with prints on top of prints so what is prince which uh smears smudges and stuff like that and then she details the case of these three lawyers i believe in chicago who have no training with fingerprints whatsoever but go online and take uh, the test that allows you to go into the courtroom and claim you're an expert on fingerprint analysis so you know let's say you, you have somebody on trial for robbery uh the cop says look we found this guy's print on the doorknob he says, I've, I've never been to the house. I don't know what you're talking about. But the officer says, I'm a fingerprint analysis expert. That print says he, his, you know, hand was on the doorknob. He doesn't have an alibi or doesn't have anybody to attest to his alibi. Um, so that, that means he's guilty, right? Well, in reality, it could be that four or five different people had touched the doorknob. You have all these different overlapping things. And, and so it doesn't show. So anyways, what these people did is they went and they took that certification test. You know, to make the claim that you know, somebody is definitely guilty because of fingerprints. And they scored 11 out of 12 right and, and passed the test. And it turns out that the tests are so easy that just about everybody passes them, including uh, the Chicago police officers who have no training or background in fingerprint analysis. So, uh, you know, this seems to me to be a real problem in convicting people of crimes, um, not just, you know, murders and capital you know, punishment, but, you know, even burglaries and stuff like that. And when we look at all these people who have now been put to death, there's a lot of questions coming out about about their you know potential innocence. Uh, luckily, Mr. Reed, Rodney Reed in Texas, uh, has uh, been granted a stay of execution. However, there's a guy in Georgia, Mr. Cromarty, who was actually put to death, you know, with questions outstanding about you know DNA evidence that was never tested and stuff like this. Again, DNA te- uh, evidence is something that. You know, we kind of think of the CSI moment where, uh, I don't know what the guy's name is, but whoever, you know, played the, the main character for the first few years on the show, you know, kind of goes up there and says, you know, this is what the DNA says. Like, this person w- was there, family there, you know, we found their DNA under her fingernails and stuff like that. Well, you know, maybe DNA is easy, like when you are you have like a, a situation in, in a lab where you're able to swab, a, you know, something and you have just one person's DNA, but... Oftentimes, DNA, I guess, ends up overlapping, and so then the, the certainties aren't quite so much that, and it's just a percentage chance. So, you know, as Americans, um, I'm guessing most of my audience is American, probably sit on juries, I just thought it'd be useful for everybody to have the, the general knowledge that, you know, that even the, the kind of concrete-sounding friends of sciences are often, uh, you know, kind of questionable, and, you know, there's a large profit incentive. Uh, for people to like uh, di- distinguish themselves in the, as experts in this kind of friends of science, like gunshot analysis or blood splatter analysis, it turns out almost all this stuff is actually fake. Uh, but at the same time, you know, uh, getting yourself certified as an expert and going and testifying can make you tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of dollars. All right, on to the Patriot Act, where you know the Dems who are constantly complaining about how Trump is the most dictatorial, totalitarian president ever have no problem whatsoever giving this guy uh, continuing power to spy on Americans. That was extended three months. Uh, we now know that Trump is using the Patriot Act to indefinitely detain a non-American citizen, a Palestinian man who was uh, convicted of terrorism, sentenced to 15 years, and now is kind of like the Palestinian people in, in a stateless position where nobody will take him. And so the U.S. has been ordered to release him from prison. Uh, but, you know, Donald Trump invoked this section of the Patriot Act that allows non-American uh, citizens to be detained indefinitely. Uh, what happened to this guy is I guess he was sending some money uh, back to people in Bosnia or something like that. And these were labeled as extremist groups. Uh, he did this for several years and it was not illegal. Uh, then he did it once after the law was passed. I believe this was like a 9-11 type law uh, that was passed that forbade this money. He then sent it again. And they popped him. They gave him 15 years uh, or a couple more. Maybe it was 15 because he should have been released in 2007. So being a Palestinian, you really don't have a state. Um, Israel isn't, I'm, I'm guessing, going to let him come back. Uh, you know, and then Jordan or Lebanon both say no. And, and this guy has nowhere to go except stay in the U.S. But then the U.S. says, no, we're just going to lock you up. So. We have an indefinite detention thing going on now. This is the abuses of powers created by the terror wars. Another example of this is the Trump administration is now considering having all American citizens uh, being photographed, leaving and entering the country. 
Of course, this is data that will probably be used, you know, for mass surveillance kind of stuff. And it has nothing to do with safety. And I could point this out because they have this system at uh, the, the local airport to me. And as I was coming back from an international trip, I had to get photographed. And uh, me and, and my traveling companion uh, had accidentally switched, uh, you know, uh, tickets. So she had mine. I had hers. When we went to the agent to give him, you know, the photo that's supposed to prove it's you for whatever reason. Didn't even look at it. Put it down. I realized that I have hers in my hand. And I explained to him. He shrugs the shoulders and I walk right on by. So obviously this has nothing to do with any kind of safety. And it's just another way to spy on Americans. Uh, General Dynamics will be getting two contracts. Uh, one from, or I guess both from the Navy. One of them for Virginia class submarines. Uh, a twenty billion dollar contract for nine submarines over the course I believe the next ten years. Who knows how much I'll actually end up costing? And then they're going to get three quarters uh, of a billion dollars uh, to supply this uh, the Navy with satellite communications. And I guess Lockheed Martin is getting you know the contract for actually building the satellites and uh, General Dynamics is the one building the ground communication centers. Again, this is uh, three quarters of a billion dollars. There's this law in Singapore I want to talk about where they, they passed a, a, some kind of free speech uh, fake news law where the government is allowed to kind of censor and post corrections to people's uh, stuff wherever they deem uh, you know online presence, independent blogs, stuff like that. So this comes up for the first time. There's a blogger who posts something that the Singapore government, I really don't understand the political dynamics here, uh, posts something the Singapore government doesn't like. Uh, he's then kind of hit with this law and told to amend it and post a correction. He refuses. Uh, the, so the government goes to Facebook and they say, hey, you have to post a correction on this. So far, Facebook has not weighed in, but it's going to be interesting to see what direction goes. I'm sure there's an awful lot of totalitarian governments around the world paying keen attention to this, wondering if they could also get content that they don't want stripped off of Facebook. All right. And then one story on Julian Assange here, and he is now set to testify in a Spanish court hearing. Uh, and this is about the case where a Spanish company, this guy Morales, um, not the Bolivian president, but spelled the same, uh, was the head of a company that was spying on Julian Assange in the Ecuadorian embassy uh, while he was there for seven years. Uh, this included in spying on his privileged conversations with lawyers. Um, they said that uh, they posted different kind of stickers on the windows that made it easier for the CIA to use whatever kind of, you know, extreme listening devices they have to pick up more of his conversations. They put listening devices in the women's bathroom and in the meeting room hidden in the fire extinguisher. Uh, they say Assange did his best to use like white noise machines, but still, I, I mean, you know, even if you're just like kind of talking to yourself out loud while you're alone or, or, you know, in the bathroom thinking like you have at least a, bit of a little bit of a private conversation, maybe open up to somebody, you know, and tell them things that you don't want the U S government knowing just like on a personal level. Uh, you know, it's like, hey, th this really sucks where I'm at. I don't know how much longer I could do this. You know, the, the U.S. government would then have access to all those conversations. Uh, Morales then collected that uh, those hard drives and then brought them back to the U.S. And so the case that I think Julian Assange should be able to make to everyone is, look, I cannot have a fair trial in the United States. Um, you know, this isn't a case where I'm accused of murdering somebody or raping somebody. And the Swedish charges have now been dropped, I believe, for a third time, saying that there's still not enough evidence to do anything with it. So, you know, he's accused of assisting, you know, Chelsea Manning with this. Uh, but he, he can't have a fair trial because the U.S. government has heard all of his uh, privileged conversations with his lawyer. So they know the defense strategies he would likely be bringing up and had all this time to prepare for it. And who knows, maybe they could have been more careful to tailor the charges against Assange in a certain way, limit him to a certain scope. Based on what, you know, the defenses they, that they feel like they understood that Assange was going to lay out anyways. So it seems like a real unfair advantage and that Assange should be able to maybe invoke this in the UK court, but the UK courts haven't treated him very fair so far. So and while there's not much hope for optimism, it should be there. All right. Talking about NATO, we have the, the 70th anniversary summit going on in, in London. And of course, it seems like the mainstream media is looking for another one, those pictures to make where all the other world leaders are kind of like looking over meanly at Trump and he's being like kind of a snide, 
jerk kind of you know just sitting there looking smug and, you know that's the that's the kind of thing i think that they're looking for kind of different conflicts between trump and the european leaders to try to make a big deal out of um but not really looking at some of the underlying rifts within nato going on right now i mean one of the biggest is that you have turkey which is a nato member state has now bought two s-400 air defense systems from russia and uh, if you listen to the russian reporting and I believe this has also come from Turkish sources. Now they're talking about purchasing more of the S-400 systems from Russia. And we have in the U.S.'s own legislator, the Senate, Lindsey Graham, and a bipartisan coalition of senators sending a memo to Donald Trump telling him that U.S. law says you have to sanction Turkey for continuing to buy these weapons. That seems like it's going to get pretty complicated in the U.S. military industrial complex if we start sanctioning Turkey's kind of arms procurement branches like we've done in russia and china uh it would prevent them from them buying u.s weapons or we would have to you know offer waivers for all of them which i don't i don't know how well that plays out politically actually sanctioning turkey for this but we have you know a, a serious call from the u.s legislator powerful members of the u.s legislator to sanction a fellow nato member state turkey has said that you know they, they're now looking to build their own uh fighter jet and that they're not going to be integrated into NATO's air defense system. So that's probably something that if there was a, you know, advantage of having a whole bunch of NATO radar linked up for whatever reason, uh, now you lose some of that. There's also conflicts between Turkey and the rest of NATO states because Turkey has a whole bunch of ISIS captives and their, you know, citizenship and passports are from all these European countries, Germany, France, the UK. And Turkey is, at this point, I guess, just sending them home because nobody's uh, taking them on uh, so far, uh, even though Turkey's law may protest, the U.S.'s law may protest. And in fact, on uh, Tuesday, the December 3rd, the first day of this conference, there is, I guess, an exchange between Trump and Marcon where Trump said that he's going to send Marcon ISIS fires. Now, some people are, are going way too far, but what Trump actually means, I'm guessing, is that the SDF has, and probably the Iraqi government as well, has a whole bunch of captured French ISIS fires that they really don't know what to do with. I'm sure these governments or, you know, militant groups would rather not, like, carry out, quote-unquote, trials and executions of these uh, foreign nationals that they could rather just send them back to their home countries. The war in Syria further complicates uh, the NATO alliance because of Turkey's position in Syria, which certainly differs from the U.S. position and most of the other European allies when it comes to the Syrian Kurds. Uh, you know, the famously, you know, the U.S. is the one that occupied eastern Syria along with the Syrian Kurds, used the Syrian Kurds as the ground forces in our air war against ISIS. However, you know, the U.K. and France had significant special operation forces, you know, on the ground deployed to Syria and were along with the U.S. in bombing Assad on two occasions during the Trump presidency after, you know, fake uh, allegations of chemical weapons attack. We now know those allegations are fake, by the way. I think I've talked about it in detail on the show, but more whistleblowers are coming forward against the OPCW, saying that Duma report is bunk. And you heard it on this show years ago. You know, me and Will Porter explaining that, hey, th this is crap. This wasn't a chemical weapons attack. And pretty much what we said back at the time happened, ended up happening. And then an OPCW report came out claiming the opposite. And now the actual researchers who went and put together, you know, what should have been the final report in the OPCW are coming out and saying that that report is absolute junk. And, and here's what the actual science said. But, you know, in, in Syria, you have this problem where Turkey views the Syrian Kurds as a terrorist organization and the rest of the Western countries view the Syrian Kurds as an ally, not a terrorist organization at all. And so... Turkey is uh, trying to hold up an Article 5 thing, which is the mutual defense pack, uh, for the Baltic defense plan, saying they won't approve to ratify it unless other NATO countries recognize the Syrian YPG, the Syrian Kurdish militia, as a terrorist organization. Now, at the NATO summit, you actually have Marcon then making comments about uh, Turkey being uh, and using proxies of ISIS forces. Uh, in Syria, which is, of course, absolutely true, talked about in the past on the show, how they've used, I think al-Nusra would be, you know, al-Nusra al-Qaeda would be a better example of the kind of forces that Turkey has deployed against the Syrian Kurds, but they're using them as shot troops against the Syrian Kurds, and there's documentation, they're carrying out war crimes against Syrian Kurds, now only in the 
uh, Rojava area of Syrian Kurdistan, but also in the Afrin area. And this happened during Operation Olive Branch, and I believe that was in uh, 2018. Uh, this more recent operation, I think Operation Peace Spring is what Turkey called it, happened uh, just at the beginning of October in 2019. Now, there's other issues going on between the United States and France. Uh, you know, and this is more recent news again, and that is France is looking at imposing some kind of digital tax that Trump says will unfairly hurt U.S., uh, you know, tech giants, Google, Apple, Face, I don't know if he said Facebook, Amazon, um, are the ones I know that he listed off. So, you know, that's problematic, first of all, that Trump is now going to impose, uh, you know, t- sanctions, tariffs, or duties on French products because it's going to hurt U.S. big business. Um, but you know, that's Trump's plan. He's, uh, saying that he's going to tax French champagne, cheeses, handbags, and about $2.4 billion worth of goods, uh, and a hundred percent duty on those. So more, more splits and breaks coming, uh, with, within NATO. Uh, of course, a couple weeks ago, it was the French president, Marcon, who was giving an interview to the economist and kind of pointing out that NATO doesn't have an enemy. Uh, you know, it's not, Russia's not an enemy anymore. NATO doesn't need to exist to combat Russia. Uh, I've heard Marcon point out recently that, hey, you know, the French have, uh, tried in nuclear missiles. These are enough to, uh, kind of mutually ensure destruction, defend Europe from Russia. So, uh, you know, with that, you know, there, there's really no reason to have to count on the American, uh, you know, army. Which, if the Americans are involved in NATO, you, you would think that me it was dissolved. And then he went on, and this was the headline, to call NATO brain dead. Now, you know, not everybody is aware of this, but NATO actually left, or excuse me, France actually left NATO for several years and wasn't again a member state until 2009. So, it wouldn't be crazy for France to once again leave NATO. It happened before. In fact, Donald Trump, who, you know, is, is old enough to, I'm sure, remember this story more, fr- more freshly than most people, uh, you know, kind of said that he wouldn't be surprised to see uh, France leave NATO. Now, the, you know, those are the more recent headlines and all the crats and fissures and split w- within NATO. But there are some other things going on. Uh, long-standing Trump has been demanding that other countries up their spending. Uh, Germany keeps saying, oh, yeah, we're going to increase it. But they never increase it very much. They certainly won't hit the 2% target that Trump has demanded. Uh, I know Canada and some other uh, NATO countries put together a package that uh, up the amount of money that they were going to pay to the general NATO fund, and then the U.S. would have to pay less. I guess this was a way, you know, to appease Trump and let him claim a victory. The bigger picture here is that NATO's not necessary anymore. Uh, NATO stopped being necessary after the fall of the USSR, and, you know, even up until then, I, I guess you probably question how necessary this, like, you know, massive military uh, alliance was, but you know, especially after the fall of the USSR, easy to say that this this treaty is no longer necessary and it should have dissolved, but rather it's expanded. This has provoked a lot of the problems that uh, the U.S. now has with Russia. Uh, Putin very recently said the base problem with NATO is expansion. You know, it's not necessarily that this alliance exists or that this alliance exists with kind of the long-standing collective goal of countering Russia, which, you know, really isn't even no longer needed, but that's not the fundamental problem. It's that Russia, that NATO has expanded all the way up to Russia's borders. It exalted most of the former war pack countries, uh, several former actual states of the USSR, and has even now laid out plans to allow the, you know, joining of Ukraine and NATO, or Ukraine and Georgia, uh, which would be absolute red lines for Russia. So yeah, I, I think NATO's obsolete. Time for NATO to go. Uh, hopefully this would allow maybe, a, you know, present an opportunity for the U.S. to roll out some talks with Russia or even, hell, say we'll dissolve, you know, NATO and then, you know, leverage that into may- maybe Russia making some nuclear concessions or, uh, withdrawing forces from certain areas. Yeah, I'm sure there's, you know, some kind of deal that could be cut with the dissolving in NATO, but, uh, it should be done no matter what, whether you can make a deal or not. Um, and then hopefully the U.S. and Russia could set up and start making other deals because we do have, you know, real issues coming up here with the new Star Treaty, which is set to expire in February 2021. And the Trump administration doesn't really seem to be taking very much interest in renewing this. Russia has put out that they now feel that a new deal couldn't be put in place. So the idea was is that you negotiate a new start. This treaty lasts for 10 years. 
And then in that time, you've negotiated and, uh, you know, now you're going to roll back, uh, you know, and get rid of another 500 newts or something like that. But rather what's happened is, is, you know, relationship with between the U.S. and Russia has gotten even worse. And so now there's threats to not even extend this treaty another five years. And that's what Russia has proposed. Donald Trump, uh, you know, just recently said that the Russians want to make a deal, but then went on to say that he wants China involved. This seems to be something of a non-starter. China's nuclear program is far different than uh, the United States and Russia's. They do have a meaningful nuclear triad, but, you know, 90-something percent of the, newest, the nuclear weapons on this planet are held by the U.S. and Russia, and China has a small nuclear arsenal by comparison. And so it seems unlikely that they're going to limit their nuclear arsenal uh, further since theirs is so far behind the U.S. and Russia's. So I think that might be a poison pill if... Trump insists that China has to be involved in some kind of deal. Um, uh, in some good news-ish, I guess, Russia allowed U.S. inspectors to look at their hypersonic, I believe they're the Avangard uh, missiles that carry all these warheads and definitely ensure that the U.S. missile defense systems cannot prevent, prevent um, you know, Russia from launching a retaliatory strike should the U.S. try to carry out a first strike against Russia. And then about a week later, uh, and this happened today, uh, a senior State Department official said Russia is in compliance with the New START Treaty. Now, I said a whole bunch of other terrible things that aren't true, but saying that Russia is in compliance with the New START Treaty sounds like a, a little bit of good news. Right, there's some other stories I want to run through before I wrap up. Um, Secretary of State Pompeo says the U.S. will support Latin American countries that are, you know, kind of suppressing unrest and violence. My guess is that he's referring to the right wing, uh, you know, countries in the region, Brazil, Colombia, Argentina, who are trying to suppress more left wing movements. And, you know, now the uh, unrest against the coup government in Bolivia. But he's not talking about, let's say, the unrest or yeah, the unrest in Venezuela, where the U.S. will not work with the Venezuelan government to uh, squash the Gaido movement, which we actually support the opposition there. Trump said he will place steel and aluminum taxes on Brazil and Argentina, accusing these countries of currency manipulation harming the United States. In Afghanistan, we had Trump traveling there for Thanksgiving, uh, saying that he believes there could be a ceasefire, saying that he thinks that talks uh, could restart with the Taliban. Taliban confirming that talks have restarted. I've seen the Taliban put out a statement saying that they want to pick it up where talks left off. Um, haven't heard any other news on how these talks are going, what the U.S. is saying, if, you know, kind of the deal's consistent as before, or if um, the U.S. is now asking for more and the Taliban are going to back out. Uh, Secretary of State Esper said that U.S. troops could withdraw uh, to some level from Afghanistan with or without negotiations with the Taliban, suggesting that maybe Trump is playing a drawdown in the next year. The number they have uh, kind of suggests is 8,600 is what we could have in Afghanistan, according to them, without harming our counterterrorism abilities. So, you know, Trump's looking to somewhat appease his base. Uh, he's going to try to get the level of number of troops back down to the, the number that Obama had when he left office uh, by the time 2020 uh, 20 rolls around. That, that's kind of what I'm thinking. Uh, civilians dying all over the place in Afghanistan and Taliban controlled uh, territory, 15 members of an Afghan family were headed to a wedding and were killed by a roadside bomb that set off on their car drove by. Uh, and then a U.S. drone strike hit a house in Afghanistan and killed six, uh, multiple children there dead. So, you know, it, it's a tragedy what's happening in Afghanistan. And at the very least, at this point, the U.S. could leave. Sure, there's going to be bloodshed in Afghanistan after the Americans leave, but maybe then uh, some kind of balance of power could start to be found uh, because now you just have the U.S. propping up a government that can't hold on. They continue to lose territory, and yet the U.S. is dropping a record number of bombs and killing a record number of civilians. A U.N. report says that the Israeli occupation of Palestine has cost the Palestinian economy $48 billion between 2000 and 2017. You know, this is one part of the Palestinians' plight that uh, a lot of people don't realize necessarily or, or think about when, when they think about the problem. They're like, oh, the U.S. gives... Uh, the Palestinians all this money, the world community gives us Palestinians all this money. Well, it's because the Israeli occupation is preventing them from having any kind of economy. Look at Gaza, 44% unemployment. 
and you know you can't import construction materials and all this so how can you even begin to have you know an economy and uh you know people make money and have any sort of life uh, for the palestinians if if their economies are, are limited so much uh syria it was interesting the uae uh one of their foreign spokesperson uh, said they hoped that syria would stabilize under the great leadership of bashar al-assad so that seems to further cement the relationship uh, between those two countries as it, it seems some of the gcc countries uh qatar oman kuwait bahrain less so saudi arabia start to reform some of the ties with assad after they supported the uprising against him heavy clashes have broken out in the idlib province about 100 people dead in the past two days at this point as assad's forces are advancing on the al-qaeda linked uh jihadists there of course, civilians are dying in these strikes. Um, uh, in one case, a Syrian airstrike hit a market and killed 10 civilians. I read another one. This is the only source on this one was the White Helmets, but it said a Syrian airstrike hit next to a school and killed uh, a, a dozen or so people. Uh, but again, the White Helmets are, are a pretty shaky source. And then, of course, there's Turkish airstrikes going on, on the other side of the Euphrates River in Syria in, in the Kurdish-controlled areas. And uh, those have killed 10 civilians as well. All right, Yemen, before I wrap up here, uh, a Saudi, it, it looks like, airstrike killed uh, 20 migrants that were traveling through Yemen on their way to Saudi Arabia. Not sure why they were targeted. Uh, the Red Cross says that 128 Houthi prisoners have uh, been released from Saudi Arabia and transported to the Yemeni capital. Saudi Arabia says they released 200 prisoners. I, I'm not quite sure why there's a discrepancy between the Saudi claim and uh, the the claim that the Red Cross is pointing out. I tend to believe the Red Cross over the Saudi government. Uh, the Houthis uh, claim to have down a Saudi attack helicopter. And then a German court reverses a de facto ban on selling armored vehicles, uh, German companies, to Saudi Arabia. So that's unfortunate because it looks like the Saudis are going to get more weapons uh, to massacre the Yemenis with. All right, everybody. Thanks for tuning into the show. Uh, check it out at the Libertarian Institute. End of the year fund drive is going on there right now. So if you like the Institute, uh, think about throwing a couple bucks to Scott, Pete, Sheldon, and, uh, you know, supporting my work along with that as well. Um, Patreon.com is the way you donate to my show. On Twitter, I'm at K-Y-A-A-A-L-E. Um, I'm the assistant editor at Antiwar.com. 